the announcements are, we have Passover coming up. We also have the Feast of Unleavened Bread coming up. We also have Feast of First Fruits coming up. So this is uh, where we're starting to run towards the end of the month where the month disappears, even though we still have plenty of days in it because we have feast days that are halfway through the week and we get to like each other. That or you stop coming, one of the two. Um, so uh, <laughs> just, and we, we, get to see, we get to see a lot of each other here pretty soon because it's the feast days. And the feast days are awesome. They're unbelievable. They're amazing. Um, let's see here. Passover is uh, looks like it's Wednesday. Is that right, KJ? Am I reading that pr properly? Uh, so it's that is that is that Tuesday evening? Tuesday evening. Tuesday evening is when we're going to be doing the Passover here. Um, generally speaking, we like to do it like earlier. So, um, but we also recognize the fact that Passover is actually a work day. So, because it's a work day, we do take into account that people do have schedules, and they do things like work frequently. For my part, I feel like I should take the, you know, maybe get off a little early. So I'll be doing that. I'll make it a point. Okay. But we'll probably be getting together right around six-ish or so, something along those lines. And we're going to be here and uh, just remember, remember to, isn't that usually what we do? Isn't it Tuesday? What did I say? Tuesday night? Yeah. Tuesday night. Because Wednesday's Feast of Unleavened Bread day one. Boom. Followed by the Sabbath, followed by Feast of First Fruits, followed by Feast of Unleavened Bread Day, seven, followed by the Sabbath, followed by the Sabbath, so followed by the Sabbath, 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 you know, you know, and it just, you know, you know, you know, you know how it goes. Okay. But, but the announcements to this point are we're going to keep it low and slow, and we're going to be like Feast of Unleavened Bread, day one. Tuesday night here, BYOL. Actually, you know what? I don't think so. I think we're actually providing lamb and everybody else kind of brings dishes and things like that. Just remember, it is the Feast of Unleavened Bread, so, you know, or it's going to start the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So basically what that means is if you bring leavened stuff to Passover, make sure that it's uh, very little because we want to make sure we eat it all. Otherwise, we have to huck it out the window and then people look at us weird. You follow what I'm saying? So you're better off in general to probably try to keep it down to unleavened bread, which we will cover here today. You might, you might be thinking like, well, you know, gee whiz, David, why, why would we cover Feast of Unleavened Bread? Because doesn't Passover come before Feast of Unleavened Bread? The answer is yes. For those of you who are unfamiliar with it, Passover does come before the Feast of Unleavened Bread. There's Passover. And then the Feast of Unleavened Bread. We'll get to that. And then you might be asking yourself the question, why would David cover Feast of Unleavened Bread before Passover? Because Passover comes first, and then the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Trust me, I have a plan. And my plan is this. Some of you may not be fully understanding of what the Feast of Unleavened Bread is all about. And for those of you who maybe are not familiar with it, you've been doing it your whole life, so you clearly don't count, okay? But some, some folks out there are not super familiar with the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And the Feast of Unleavened Bread means what? No leaven. And you get your leaven out. And the reason we're covering it today is so that you have one more week to start getting rid of your leaven. What we did is we sent a whole Ziploc baggie full of leaven over to Dayspring. And uh, we're, we're figuring she's like a bread person. She, she like, you know, whips it up and she turned it into bread here. So uh, did, did you use part of that? That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. So let's flip over in our Bibles. Let's flip over in our Bibles. We'll, we'll go to our favorite verse, favorite section, because we like to start there all the time because anytime we're talking feast days, if there's one passage in Scripture that we pretty much get memorized during feast days, it's Leviticus 23, baby. Yeah. All right. So Leviticus 23, and we're going to start over there in verse 6. Verse 6. Then, uh, then on the 15th day of the same month, there's a feast of unleavened bread to the Lord. For seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. And on the first day you shall have a holy convocation. You shall not do any laborious work, but for seven days you shall present an offering by fire to the Lord. And on the seventh day is a holy convocation. You shall not do any laborious work 
at all. So if it's labor, you know, KJ, no labor. Okay. No, la no laborious work. So, you know, if you're having babies, that's, uh, that's what I was talking to KJ about, you know, if you no labor. Try to try to avoid it. You know what I'm saying? He said, you can do it like in the middle of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, but on the end, no labor. So, you know, it's just like, you know, Braxton Hicks, I think that's probably okay. Anyway, so, um, but what we see is we see, we see the Feast of Unleavened Bread is a day where it says unleavened bread. It's like, well, what's the definition of unleavened bread? What does it mean? What does it actually even mean? Well, I mean, like, let's say it's, just, it's unleavened. Okay, you know, that makes sense. But let's give some more definitions. So let's flip over in our Bibles because we're only starting in Le Leviticus 23. Why? Because it's feast time season, right? And it's our thing. It's our thing. We run for, but anyway, we're going to flip over in our Bibles to Exodus. Exodus chapter 12, I believe. Let me double check that in my notes because today I actually have a couple of notes. Um, changing it up, making it real. And it just kind of falls open and it says, you want to read this. Right, that's exactly what happens. So Exodus chapter 12, verse 15. Picking up at verse 15. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread, but on the first day you shall remove leaven from your houses. For whoever eats anything leavened from the first day until the seventh day, that person shall be cut off from Israel. And on the first day you shall have a holy assembly and another holy assembly on the seventh day. No work at all shall be done on them. Well, I mean, I mean, except what must be eaten by every person. That alone may be prepared by you. You shall also observe the Feast of Unleavened Bread. For on this very day I brought your hosts out of the land of Egypt. Therefore you shall observe this day throughout your generations as a permanent ordinance. On the first of the month, on the fourteenth day of the month, at evening you shall eat unleavened bread. Until the twenty-first day of the month at evening. Seven days there shall be no leaven and found in your houses. For whoever eats what is leavened, that person shall be cut off from the congregation of Israel, whether he's an alien or a native of the land. You shall not eat anything leavened in all your dwellings. You shall eat unleavened bread. So what we see here is we see starting on the evening of the 14th day, you'll notice it doesn't say twilight. We'll get to that later. Maybe next week. <laughs> But what we're talking about here is we're talking about the evening of the 14th. So the evening of the 14th until the evening of the 15th, what do we do? Unleavened bread. It's a, it's a Sabbath on the first day of the week, and it's a Sabbath on the last. Now, it's not like a Sunday through Saturday week. It's a, it's a seven-day period, okay? And in that seven-day period, Feast of Unleavened Bread, Sabbath on the first day, Sabbath on the last day, okay? Now, it also says, make sure to get the leaven out, right? Did you catch that right there? For all the bread people out there, they spring, no leaven, no leaven. Now, you know, the, what, what is, you know, and, 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 and what is it, what are we, what are we actually doing? Now, this, this, the concept of unleavened bread is very specific. The, the, the concept of why we're actually doing this is not just a function of, yeah, we're just coming up with some cool thing. It's like, eh, some random thing we came up with. No, Feast of Unleavened Bread is very specifically something that we're doing on purpose to commemorate the time where the people of Israel left Egypt, and they left, and they left quickly, and they didn't have time to r have their bread rise, and they left, and they went out, and they just went. They also call it the bread of affliction, too, because you know what? You just feel a little bit more spiritual when you're eating crackers, I guess, okay? But if, but see, but see, this is designed for us to evaluate and look and see and see that the actually Feast of Unleavened Bread is actually a thing because you know what? It's one thing for you to be like, oh, yeah, Ma, this is one of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, but it's a totally different thing when you actually live the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And when you live the Feast of Unleavened Bread, you know what, you know, you know the people who actually think about it the most? Kids. You want to know why? Kids are always hungry. Moms? Okay. 
they had, I did not, I would not look like this if it weren't for kids. Because Eric and I would be like, well, I'm not that hungry. Okay. But the kids are always like, I'm hungry. And then once you make them food, you're like, I'll have a little. Then, then, then after you're done eating what you want, the kids are like, I had my snack. Here's the rest of my food. Then five minutes later, what do they want? And then five minutes later, what do they want? And then five minutes later, and that's why you moms have cars that you open the door and goldfish fall out, okay? So that when that sort of thing happens, do you want to know the people who really pick up on the fact that you're having unleavened bread? Oh, man, it's your kids. And God designed it that way. It's like, Hans, like, are you saying that the Lord designed kids to have the metabolism to, like, burn through food like water? I'm not saying that. But there might be a connection. That's all I'm saying. Because if you flip over in the very next chapter, chapter 13, we'll pick up in verse 1. Then the Lord spoke to Moses. The Lord spake unto Moshe. <clears throat> That's for, it depends on what your translation. Mine, mine doesn't say that, but I like to just say that periodically. <laughs> Sanctify to me every firstborn, the first offspring of every womb among the sons of Israel, both of man and beast. It belongs to me. And Moses said to the people, remember this day in which you went out from Egypt, from the house of slavery. For by a powerful hand, the Lord brought you out from this place and nothing leavened shall be eaten. And on this day of the month of Abib, you are to go forth. And it shall be when the Lord brings you to the land of the Canaanite, the Hivite, the Amorite, the Hittite, the Jebusite, which he swore to your fathers to give you, a land flowing with milk and honey, that you shall observe this rite in this month. For seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. And on the seventh day there shall be a feast to the Lord. Unleavened bread shall be eaten throughout the seven days. And nothing leavened shall be seen among you, nor shall any leaven be seen among you and all your burners. And you shall tell your son on that day, saying, It's because of what the Lord did for me when I came out of Egypt. And it shall serve as a sign to you on your hand and as a reminder on your forehead and that the law of the Lord may be in your mouth, for with a powerful hand the Lord brought you out of Egypt. Therefore, you shall keep this ordinance. It is appointed time from year to year. Now it shall come about when the Lord brings you to the land of the Canaanite, as he swore to you and to your forefathers to give to you, that you shall devote to the Lord the first offspring of every womb and the first offspring of every beast that you own. The males belong to the Lord. But every the firstborn of donkey you shall redeem with a lamb. But if you do not redeem it, then you shall break its neck. And every firstborn man shall break it. Uh, firstborn of man among you, your sons you shall redeem. You don't break their necks. And there's a slip of the tongue there. It's like wrong next page, first thing, okay? Verse 14, it shall come about when your son, when your son asks you in time to come, saying, what is this? Then you shall say to him with a powerful hand, the Lord brought us out of Egypt from the house of slavery. And it came about when the Pharaoh was stubborn about letting us go, that the Lord killed every firstborn of the land of Egypt, both the firstborn of man and the firstborn of beef, beast. Therefore, I sacrifice to the Lord the males, the first offspring of every womb, but every firstborn among my sons. Don't worry, son. I redeem. Now it shall serve as a sign on your hand and phylacteries on your forehead, for with a powerful hand the Lord brought us out of Egypt. May the Lord bless the reading of the word. That's uh, something that's left over from, you know, the Baptist background. So, anyway, so because here, here's the thing. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. You'll notice this whole setup. It's like, Lord, uh, you know, this is so, so, so during the Feast of Unleavened Bread, when your kids look up to you in those big, big eyes and they say, Mom, why can't we have any fishies? Son, it is because the Lord brought us. And you're supposed to say this to them. And when they look at you and they kind of squint their eyes a little bit and they're like, uh, okay, eventually they'll get it. You just keep on doing it, okay? Positive repetition. You follow up, say positive reinforcement. Here's a cracker. You know what I'm saying? Okay. Now the Feast of Unleavened Bread is super important. So we're supposed to make sure we actually get all the leaven out of the house. 
And you can, there's lots of different places you can read. You can read Numbers. You can read Deuteronomy. And there's lots of different places. So this is definitely a solid thing in Scripture. And, and, and the word uses, the Lord uses words when it talks about the Feast of Unleavened Bread. It uses words like <laughs> perpetual. In other words, like, did you get this? Eternally. And, and, and words like this, forever. Do you know what that means? If you are going to go before the Father, and he says, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of your master. If you're in that position, guess what? You will be doing the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So you know what? Better start practicing. Better start practicing. Now's your time to shine, baby. And if you don't know how to do it, you know, you do your thing and do it as best you know how to do. And as you do it, the Lord's going to call you to more, and he's going to call you to more, and he's going to call you to more. And I, mean, I tell you what, man, the first time we did Feast of Unleavened Bread, I mean, there wasn't a whole heck of a lot of depth. But I did read this, and it says, you know, get that leaven out of your house. And I realized just before we started cooking up the lamb that, man, we had leaven in our house. And I told you before, and I tell you again, I took all the leaven in the house, put it in a big old huge garbage bag, Hucked it out the back door into the other side of the fence so that it's not within the borders of my property. And that's why I'm telling this to you today. Do not hit Costco and do the Costco run for your house and fill that Costco cart with leaven. Because you know what? You are wasting money. You know what I'm saying? You eat, and then the next year came around, and the next year came around, and we were like, oh, yeah, dude, we're going to get all the leaven out. We collected all the buns, not like, you know, but like, you know, hamburger buns and hot dog buns, you know, okay? And we, like, put all them, and then we started, and then we realized we were in a problem when we actually didn't, when we didn't looked at some of the packages of food that we had roaming around the house. You would be amazed at how much leaven is in your diet, and you have no idea. Why? Because your body likes leaven. It loves leaven. Loves leaven. And those food people figured it out, and they put leaven on crackers. They put leaven on Doritos. See, you can't be eating Doritos here during the Feast of the Lemon Bread because you look on there, it says lots of leaven. That's what it says on there. Why? Because they, they, took, they took an unleavened bread and they dipped it in leaven, those turkeys. Yeah, Cool Ranch Doritos, Nacho Doritos. See, all of us actually have this alternate meaning when we talk about them bad chickens, okay? So get the Doritos out of your life, amen? Okay, so here's the, here's the thing. Here's the thing. We're supposed to get leaven out of our house. Well, what is leaven? Leaven is something that when you put it in, you know, come on, you bakers, you know what I'm talking about, right? You know what leaven is. Leaven is that little thing you put inside the mixture to change the chemical composition of the structure so it changes the way that it reacts, both the way it grows and the way it operates. It's something that goes in and changes the molecular structure of everything. Because it changes it in a very in a very minute way. I mean, this is this this is what leaven runs into. I mean, it's not like you know some people is like, well, you know, I think this is leaven. So I think this is leaven. I think that's leaven. The thing is, is if if you if you're having something that gets into something else to cause it to rise, that would be leaven, according to my definition. Yeah, you need to find out what the Lord says, but you. See, but here's the thing. Here's the thing. Sometimes, you know, you might put you might put a little something in there and you didn't mix it up right and it didn't get in with everything. It doesn't cause things to rise and it doesn't work right. I mean, you know, how many how many bakers we got in here? Now, now, what kind of cookies do you like? Do you like do you guys like those cookies that rise? Do you like the cookies? How many, how many people here? Come on. They said, we're taking a poll. You don't have to raise your hand if you don't want to. I'm not telling you what to do. But I'm just running a kind of a generic poll here. How many people like cookies that have a little bit of rice to them? 
How many of cook? How many of you guys like cookies like my dad likes, where they're like hockey pucks? It's like you pour the chocolate chip concoction on on the thing, and it just goes, and then it just it cooks in there. And of course, it's 100% wheat, so does it rise? No, sorry. And what, at what point do you have to eat them? When they roll out of the oven, liquid, the, the, the chocolate inside is like lava. The outside is like, you know, uh, it's like a cracker, actually. If you wait a couple minutes, it's like a cracker. Like, you can throw it against the wall, it will go through the plaster. I mean, I'm pretty sure, pretty sure, okay? And my dad loved to actually dip his, 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 his whole wheat cookies and, and soak them, yeah, and pre-soak them in milk, you know. And I think that that's a, I think that's why he made them that way. But anyway, so my, uh, how many people prefer those kind of cookies? Do, do you soak them? See, same thing. See, some people that I don't judge. It's totally good. It's like, you know, I need to have somebody to give all the hard cookies to. Now I know it's going to be Rachel. Okay. See, but what we see is we see, generally speaking, uh, you notice the average, most people actually like things that rise. And leaven rises things. And you're saying, well, what kind of definition are we talking about leaven? Why, what, 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 what is leaven or what is not leaven? When I'm looking in my packages and I'm looking at all these things, these pre-processed foods that I filled my freezer full of, you know, how do I know whether or not it's leaven? Well, you know what? If it says leaven, that might be a dead giveaway, right? You'd be surprised how much that, come on. Aren't we always surprised? We are always surprised at how much has leaven. How does it that, that we don't know? We just donated to people, just giving people the sin. See, I think there should be, a, I think you should have a moral dilemma every time you do it, even when you do it, because you're probably going to do it. But you should, you should feel bad at least a little bit that you're like, hey, um, I have all this sin, and I don't want to have it in my house. I will give it to you. <laughs> Live long and prosper. Okay? Come on, doesn't it seem wrong every time? But you're like, but it's good stuff, right? We'll give it to people who sin. And you should feel bad. So anyway, so but this that's part of the reason why we we think ahead on the Feast of Unleavened Bread to get that stuff out of the house because you don't want it in the house and you don't want to have to feel bad by pawning it off and giving it to somebody who. I mean, because the funny thing is, is, OK, so here's here's the part where I feel bad because it's like, OK, when you give it to people, I used to like, ah, oh, here comes the Feast of Unleavened Bread. How many of my siblings actually don't do the Torah? I'll give it to them. They have first right of refusal. And generally speaking, they all do. But here's the thing. I always felt bad because it's like, okay, does their lack of understanding in Torah excuse the fact that they're doing something wrong? Am I actually feeding that? Just saying. It makes me feel bad. It's like, but, you know, if I don't give it to them, you know that they're going to go over to Costco and they're going to buy them out of all the hamburger buns that they've got. and bread. Anyway, so here we go. Here we go. What is leaven? What is leaven? Now, we could get into this big, huge discussion about what is specifically leaven. It's like, you know, is it baking soda? Is it baking powder? Is it is it salt? Is it um, – some of those are easier than others, right? Uh, you know. Um, you know, so then we have uh, just actually the function of something actually being in air. Okay. So how long does it take? This is a good question. I don't know that I actually know the answer to it. Do we have any people who know a fair amount about sourdoughs here? Okay, since, since you know something about sourdough, how long does it take the sourdough mixture to get from, like, where you're, like, putting it all together to the point where you can actually use it? The starter? Yeah, the starting to start. I know. Interesting. So it's about a week. Interesting. Interesting. Big, but you have to actually start to start, right? Because if you don't start, if you already have the starter, it's already there. 
and it has accumulated all of the stuff and the base product. And this is where you start to say, as a sourdough person, you can't help but think it's like, maybe I'll take it over on mom's. I'm just going to ship it to her, and then you can ship me start back whenever, okay, you know, whatever kind of mental gymnastics you feel the Lord's saying is okay. Okay. But here's the thing you start when you put the, 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 the sourdough starter together and you start it. It takes a week to actually get it started. And and it's kind of and uh, the funny thing is, is most of you people, when you're talking about yeast, you don't really think about the starter. But the sourdough person here definitely thinks about that. We got a starter from um, one of the state senators that they had um, uh, all the uh, senators of the state of Alaska ended up getting a sourdough starter for the senators sourdough. You follow what I'm saying? So everybody would continue to have the because the Alaska you've ever heard of anybody ever heard of Alaska sourdough yeah well it's a person too um you know what I'm saying but it has a double meaning you follow what I'm saying so it's like kind of one of those things where they're trying to maintain the roots of the of the state and stuff like that so they're running a sourdough starter and some of them are sourdoughs but you know it's like you know and so like maybe and we got one, and then we Erica was so happy, and she was using it. It was really cool. You know, it has this meaning to it and everything. And then the first thing in love of bread happens, and we're like, <sighs> because what it does is that sourdough starter has an essence to it that is not going to be the same when you start another one. Now, why is it that it has an essence that, y d that the next one doesn't? Because what it has picked up. What's picked up? See now, if we were just a if we were just a fellowship that you know prided ourselves on our legalism and our adherence to tradition, um, we would be talking about um, some various other different things. Um, we would define to you specifically which kind of recipes actually sourdough starters would be. Um, we would say as long as you give it to your neighbor and then bring it back, that's totally fine. I mean, this the, the I mean, we would come up with different ways for you to avoid actually doing the law while still doing the law. Uh, adhering to the letter of the law, if not the spirit of the law. You follow what I'm saying? I mean, some of some of you I, I, I heard from I heard from a sister of mine who's saying, yeah, so 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 some Orthodox folks were saying that uh, that you could actually have leaven in your house. You just can't make anything out of it. And I'm like. Did you read what I mean, you guys heard when we read what we just read? Dude, that's messed up. It's like, I'm going to make somebody sin even more. Okay? Because it's okay, they're Gentiles. You know what? Just because they're not of the tribe of Judah doesn't make them not Israel. <laughs> what? Anyway. Come on. They do. They, do, you, do you realize that's a thing? That they will keep leaven and they say, well, as long as you're not using it to actually cause something to rise. But it says, get all the leaven out. Whether it's if whether it's functional leaven or not. Just says get it out. But we're not talking about legalism here. We're not talking about legalism. We're not talking about the traditions of men. We're not talking about what the Talmud says. We're not talking about any of that stuff. What we're talking about stinking what does good old bible say and sometimes this is the way we view things a lot is because we are torah observant spirit filled christ following what new covenant believers and because we're new covenant believers we know that the feast of unleavened bread is more than just kicking leaven out of your house it's more than just spending a week, you know, cutting back on some of you guys are like, you know, kind of a little more receptive to like, you know, breads than others. You know, it's like going on a diet almost. OK, you know, but it's more than that. It's even more than us merely looking back at the time where the people of Israel left Egypt and ate the bread of affliction. It's way more than that. 
what are you we gonna actually like limit ourselves to just that see the thing is is the feast of unleavened bread and passover those are days that the lord has set aside as his high holy days his important days Things happen on those days, and they don't happen on those days on accident. Do I hear an amen? Did you know, did you know that Joshua, when they came into the promised land, you know what day, you know what time that was? Passover is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Coincidence? I think not. Christ died on Passover. And then immediately following that, we have unleavened bread. Coincidence? I think not. You know, when you start talking about the feast days, you know, this is kind of the funny part about this whole thing is when we have our buddies who are like, you know, aren't necessarily quite, you know, on board fully yet in the whole doing the Sabbath thing and everything like that. You know, there, it's, there, there's absolutely no wiggling out of this one for them. What, do you not love Jesus? That's what Passover literally is all about. What do you think unleavened bread is all about? It's about getting the yeast out. So what is Yeshua? So let's actually, you know, hey, since it's all about Yeshua here, Jesus, depending on your perspective and what kind of phraseology you like to use, okay, what did Yeshua see leaven as? An idea, a concept, a way of looking at things, a way of understanding something that jades you and changes the whole outlook and future growth of your life. You're like, wow, that's very sweeping. Uh-huh. And I wish I could be more sweeping. Because that's what Yeshua, that's what Christ labeled leaven as. You know what? Let's go. Flip over to Matthew. Here we go. Matthew, we're going to start. We're going we're gonna to kind of pop around because that's the way we like to do things. We're going to start in Matthew. Matthew chapter 16. Why? Because it's awesome. And we're going to kind of like read the whole chapter because, you know, the times are such in the world. And the things that have happened here recently are such that we're going to read <coughs> starting in verse 1. As opposed to starting where we're really going to read, and you'll catch on really quick. When the Pharisees and the Sadducees came up testing him and asked him to show them the sign from heaven, he answered said to them, When it's evening, you say, Oh, it'll be fair weather for the sky's red. In the morning, Oh, they're going to be storm today for the sky's red and threatening. Do you not know how to discern the appearance of the sky, but cannot discern the signs of the times? An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and a sign will not be given except for the sign of Jonah. And he left them and went away. I say that because kind of recently we had a sign of Jonah. Anyway, just saying. Verse 5. And the disciples came to each the other side and had gotten to take bread, forgotten to take bread. And Yeshua said to them, now watch out and beware the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And then they began to discuss among themselves, saying, is it, is it, is it because we, is it because we didn't take any bread? Is it, what is it? Actually, I, feel, I don't know. You really, but Yeshua, aware of this, says, you men of little faith, why do you discuss among yourselves that you have no bread? Do you not yet understand or remember the five loaves of the 5,000 and how many baskets you took up? Or the seven loaves and the 4,000 or how many large baskets you took? How is it that you do not understand that I am not speaking to you concerning bread? But beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And then they understood that he did not say to beware of the leaven of bread, but of the teaching of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. See, the thing is, is that was leaven and they understood what leaven is. When you put a little bit of leaven in something, it changes something. And over here, you flip over just a little bit backwards. And we go over here to chapter 13. Chapter 13, Matthew 13, 33. And it says, and he spoke another parable to them. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven, 
which a woman took and hid in three pecks of meal until it was all leavened. And all these things Yeshua spoke to the multitudes of parables, and he didn't speak to them without a parable. So that it was said to them, spoken through the prophet might be fulfilled, saying, I will open my mouth in parables, and I will utter things hidden since the foundation of the world. Leaven. It's a concept of something that's going in to change everything. So the kingdom of God is compared to leaven and the Pharisees' teaching and the Pharisees' doctrines and the Pharisees' traditions. Those are all things of leaven. So the function is, is what leaven are you, of being, are you allowing in your life to change the way that you look at everything? When you start to understand that that's what leaven is, when we start talking the Feast of Unleavened Bread, it's a time where the Lord is pouring out an anointing upon His people to get free from the leaven of the teaching that they have received that is incorrect and receive in themselves the leaven that they're supposed to have so that they can begin to operate properly. Because you know what? After seven days, that's when what was planted becomes the leaven that actually leavens the starter, right? Roughly. Kind of interesting, huh? Like, wow, there's a lot of similarities. Is it coincidence? I think not. See, now we have a whole week of unleavened bread, and do you think the Lord is actually going to limit it to a week and be like, dude, look, you know, you only have seven days to take care of literally all this sin in your life, or you're done. You have to wait till next year. No, that's not the case. But what we see is so this is something that's very consistent. That the Lord does have an anointing in this time. And he is calling his people at this time of the year to repent. He's calling his people at this time of year to evaluate your life and look in your life to see do you have leaven that you have allowed in your life in small, subtle ways that has changed the way that you grow in the Lord? Because I tell you, my friend, it grieves my heart to watch and see people who can't step out into more freedom because of the leaven that they have received from the scribes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees in their lives. And they can't let go of the teachings that are wrong. And they're so base that they don't even understand that they even exist so often. It is so fundamentally a foundation point of their faith that they don't even realize that they have made a foundation out of the leaven of the Sadducees and the Pharisees. You cannot build a house. The Lord cannot build a structure if you're making a cornerstone or a foundation stone out of leaven. It will not work. It will fall apart. It won't, hold the the it won't stand the test of time. Your walk with the Lord is going to be limited. You're only going to be able to go so far. And you'll stop. Why? Because of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Now, who were the Pharisees and the Sadducees? They were the religious experts of the day. That everybody undeniably knew that the Pharisees and the Sadducees 100% knew the Bible better than everybody. And yet they were So what people do we have today who are the religious leaders of our day who are considered to be infallible and know everything is related to Scripture? No, I'm not going to say it. You can answer that question. Whatever you feel, Holy Spirit's leading you to answer that. But I can tell you this. The Pharisees and the Sadducees of those days, they were trained in the Scripture. They were steeped in the doctrines of man. They were trained by other people 
who were trained by other people, who continued to propagate incorrect theology, incorrect doctrines. So what people have you accidentally have in your life who has planted the leaven in you? And you weren't even aware, and you weren't uh, you weren't on your defensive, and you weren't actually looking. People get on people; they're defensive all the time when you start talking about the truth, when it goes against what they already have in place. Well, why aren't they defensive? Well, th that's just the nature of it; it's just how it works. What's in you? Well, I mean, how would they know? I mean. You know, if you actually sit there and you, know, you, you, this is funny because this is armchair quarterbacking its finest. Okay, armchair quarterbacking its finest. It's like, well, I mean, duh. Hello, Yeshua knew the Bible better than the Pharisees and the Sadducees. But put yourself in that position in that very same day. Yeshua pitted himself against the Pharisees and Sadducees constantly. And in those days, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes and the lawyers, those guys, those guys were assumed to have it all dialed in. And Yeshua constantly was saying, it's not just that he was saying something contrary, he was saying, watch out. Because I'll tell you what, folks, the leaven creeps in and you don't even know it. You talk to the religious experts and their leaven will creep in and you won't even know that it has slipped into your life. And that's why Yeshua is warning his disciples. Watch out for the leaven of the scribes of the and the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Watch out because their leaven, their teaching, their doctrine their traditions are going to be insidiously working their way into your life and into your heart. And you have got to be on the alert for it. If it was something obvious, would Yeshua have had to be concerned about being telling his disciples, watch out? He wouldn't have had to mention it. Be like, they'd be like, well, that was wrong. He's not going to have to warn them about that. I mean, if the Pharisee says, you know what, it's okay. Adultery is fine. It's okay. Grace covers it. So if the Sadducees were saying that, that would be ridiculously obvious. Hey, you have to understand the people. That would be obvious. Nobody sat there. I mean, oh, you know, adultery. Yeah, that's, we, that's wrong. That's not insidious. That doesn't slip in. Stealing, oh yeah, that's, stealing's okay, grace covers it. No, that's easy. They don't need to be warned to watch out for that. I mean, granted, we've kind of worked our way down to that point where we actually have to be warned, stealing's wrong. We have to, we've worked our way down as a society, you have to be warned, actually, homosexuality is wrong, it's a sin. Fornication's a sin. Oh, grace covers it. It's still a sin, which means if you're following the Lord, you're not supposed to be doing it. See, those they didn't need warnings about stuff like that. I mean, we kind of do, but they don't. He was warning them about the things that nobody even considers to be leaven. Man, I'll tell you what, man. You want to have your spiritual walk decimated super fast? You just... Keep that leaven that you've had from all those spiritual people that you've had in your life. That you trusted. Who have continued to propagate the doctrines of man in you just as it was propagated in them. It's not like they woke up in the morning and said, I'm going to deceive man. No, they, <laughs> no, no, no. Uh -uh. They're like, I'm going to help him to actually be a better person. You know, actually, I think as soon as I say that, I'm like, they keep on thinking of the, you know, the story that Yeshua said, you know, and, you know, the, 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 these guys, they, they, 
they go across oceans and they travel long distance to proselyte somebody and make them twice as much the son of hell as themselves. And so we go, like, wow, that's really frisky. I didn't really even feel frisky on that one. It's just like, I was just reminded of that story because what they're doing is they're continuing to propagate themselves. They're not propagating the word of God. They're not propagating scripture. They're not propagating this. They're propagating their own doctrines of man. When the Bible says don't steal, it says don't steal. When Yeshua says you are to become like me, that doesn't mean that Yeshua ran around and had grace cover all of his sin. Nope. It's not the way he worked. He was sinless. So when he says be like me, it's not like we're just supposed to love everybody and be really super nice. No, you're supposed to actually be like, yeah, or, or the opposite. We're also not supposed to be like, convert or die. That's, we're also not supposed to be that either, okay? But nobody ever thinks that that's Christian. Okay. Back in the day of the Crusades, maybe, but, you know. But that's a different story, a different day. Thing is, is he was perfect, and we're called to be perfect. Grace is. Praise the Lord. Grace is amazing. I mean, the other, when we were singing that song here, that he gives grace. I just wanted to sing that one little section of the song over and over and over and over and over and over. Because the more you get free from the leaven in your life, the more you're just thankful for grace. And that's where you understand in the epistles why Paul and Peter and John and all them boys all said the same thing. May grace abound to you richly. May grace flood you. You're like, man, they're really focused on that. Yeah, because grace is the part where the Lord picks up where you lack. Grace is not what covers all your mistakes. That's the blood of Jesus. Grace is what picks up where you leave off. Mercy is you not getting what you deserve. Mercy is why we still have a country. True. Grace is you being obedient. Grace is you, is you repenting for what you've done. Grace is you saying to the Lord, I am sorry, and you not remembering all the sins that you actually did. Grace is takes all that he says it's okay you got as much as you can cover i'll take care of the rest that's grace that's grace it's not like a get out of jail you could do whatever you want and get away with the card but the feast of unleavened bread as we as we start in on the feast of unleavened bread this is your time to shine baby this is your time to take care of sin in your life, where the iniquity in your life, where the sin in your life has, has begun to grow. See, because the thing is, is one of the things, not only do we see that uh, doctrines and false teachings and those sort of things can be leavened, which I have to say I'm actually kind of a little sensitized to recently because I've seen some people who I've been talking to, and I'm like, dude, come on. I can see all of that. religious thing holding you back from what you're supposed to be doing. But you know what else? There, there's other lovings. It's not just a function of teaching. How about sin? Here's the thing is, is, when sin enters into your life, it changes the way you operate. It changes the way you see things. It changes the way you react to things. It changes the way you react to people. It changes the way people react to you. Do you think that's leaven? 100% falls into that classification of leaven. The Lord wants that out too. The Lord wants that out. So we see sin. We see leaven. Or we see the, 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 the um, doctrines of man. The teaching of the religious leaders of the time. How's that? The teachings of religious leaders and sin. You know what else is loving in your life? 
that starts small and gets big and changes everything is your flesh. You're like, but I thought you already said sin. I sure did. The flesh is different than sin. The flesh draws you towards sin. It is your, it is that nature in you that can either be a function where you're emotionally too charged with something and you start to just whoop. Or, ironically enough, it's the same flesh that's like, I am a robot. See, the flesh changes things. It's not just sin. It's not just teachings. The flesh draws you into making a decision. It might not even be a de sinful decision. It could just be wrong. Because your flesh likes it. Your body likes candida, but that doesn't mean you should eat sugar every day, all day long. Just like, high fructose corn syrup, yep, wash it down with a little cake of sugar. <laughs> Just because you like it doesn't mean you should do it. And it draws you to making conclusions and doing things and changing the way you operate in your life. Trauma, same thing. You have trauma in your life. Whatever trauma that is, it changes you. And it's leaven in your life. It changes the way you think. It changes the way you operate. It changes the way people operate towards you. It changes the way whether or not you're going to drop into sin or if you're not going to drop into sin. The trauma is the trigger that leads to something else happening. Well, guess what? Yeshua came to heal the brokenhearted. That's trauma. Yeshua came to take away sin. Yeshua calls you in order for you to be saved. You have to yield the flesh. Flesh. He came to send the Holy Spirit into your life so that when you release and let go of all of the leaven of the religious leaders of our day, he sent the Holy Spirit to lead you into all truth. Not to have you listen to another man. And if you're here today to listen to me, well, I hope that the Lord brings you about to maturity to the point where you're listening to him, to him. When I speak and you can delineate between whether it's David or whether it's the Lord. Because we need the truth of the word. We need the truth of the Holy Spirit. We do not need more doctrine. Of man. We need Bible doctrine. So we have foundational Torah studies so that you understand what real doctrine is. Real doctrine is not dependent on a, an opinion of a man. So we have all that leaven. And Yeshua came to set us free from that leaven. It's ironic because the Feast of Unleavened Bread is seven days long and it's kicked off by Passover. Which... Arguably, the most important part of Passover is the Passover lamb. And Yeshua is the Passover lamb. Let's turn over to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 5. First Corinthians 5. 1 Corinthians 5, it's around there somewhere. If you have a Bible like mine, it's actually page 1315. If you don't, you'll have to find Matthew or 1 Corinthians 5 all by yourself. 1 Corinthians 5, verse 16. Your boasting is not good. You know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough. Clean out the old leaven that you may be a new lump, just as you are, in fact, unleavened. For Christ, our Passover, also 
has been sacrificed. Let us therefore celebrate the feast. Oh, what? What? Not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Wait a second. Did you? Did Paul just tell us we're supposed to do the Feast of Unleavened Bread? Did Paul just say that? No. Grace covers a multitude of sins. Praise the Lord. It does. But, but that's, not, that's not what they, when they say grace, I do not think it means what they say it means. You follow what I'm saying? In the words of the all-wise, not, not all-wise, Vizzini. But, you know, it's like, I'm just saying. I do not think that word means what you think it means, okay? Let us not celebrate the feast with malice and wickedness, but with unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. When people say, oh, no, 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 Paul didn't. Do no, Paul totally did. And not only did Paul do, definitely do the feast, and you could see that when you read the book of Acts. It's everywhere in there. But you also see him telling you to do it. And that we're supposed to be pulling the leaven out that's not right. Wickedness, malice. All of those things that are holding you back, we're supposed to be taking out. See, because are you something that is in a position to receive the Lord's leaven? That's what the Feast of Unleavened Bread is about. We could start talking about unleavened bread, but unleavened, the, the, the leaven that we find in our houses is a physical thing that reminds us of a spiritual thing. It gives us a, a physical understanding to help us to understand a spiritual significance. When you're looking around in your house, if you're really new at the Feast of Unleavened Bread, you're going to be like, well, this is about four times the size it starts out with before it hits the oven. So that's definitely leaven. Pitch it. But then you start to look and be like, oh, dear Lord, why? this has leaven in it? Base, yeah, baking soda in your toothpaste? What in the world? Who, peels on, who, would put, who puts leaven on Doritos? I mean, <laughs> it's Doritos. I mean, it tastes good, but we have an ulterior. Anyway, so. But what we see is you see the more you look, the more you find. But if you're not looking, you won't find it. Are you looking for the leaven in your life? Because the Lord wants it out so that he can put his leaven in. And he can't put his leaven in if the old leaven is still there. Because it's going to be the same old starter. No, he wants to start fresh. He wants you to start clean. He wants to start new. And that starts with you actively, purposefully, with focus, determination, listening to the Lord, obediently doing, getting the leaven out of not only your house, but your house. And holding yourself apart from that for a week. So that he is able to speak to you and put in you the leaven that you're supposed to have. And you say seven days, roughly. For a sourdough starter to actually do something you can be something you can use, right? We have a week of unleavened bread. The ironic part is, is the Lord's life is like, he's, you're going to need more than a day. Take a whole week to get it all the way out. Seven weeks later, the Holy Spirit comes. Lord wants to put his leaven in your life. He wants to take out that other leaven. Leaven inherently is a descriptor of something that changes everything. 
The Lord wants you to take out that leaven that has changed everything in your life so that he can put his leaven in to change your life so that it operates the way he wants it to operate. <laughs> Amen? This is not negative. But I have to give up sin. If you knew the life you'd get when you do it, you'd do it even faster than what you're doing it as. If you had any idea of what freedom would be, you would, try, you would, you would just start hucking sin out the door. If you had any idea what it would be like to be free from trauma, you would give that to the Lord. Well, I don't know how to. Well, you know what? Yeshua came to set you free. He came to heal the brokenhearted. Do you catch that? I mean, do you guys catch that when I'm saying that? When we talk about trauma, he came to heal the brokenhearted. He came to heal. It does, he didn't just came to heal. He came to heal who? People who needed healing inside. He came to heal. He came to set you free. He came to bring in life, and he came to bring it in more abundantly. And the thing is, is you got to trade out the old, baby, because you know what? He's wanting to put a new thing in. You guys ready for a new thing? Because he's ready to put something new in your life. It's going to cost you all the old leaven. As we're starting this Feast of Eleven Bread, I want you to remember that. That the Lord wants to bring in something new that you don't know about. He wants to bring in something awesome that you ain't never seen. And He wants to begin to bring freedom and wholeness and fullness in your life that you never thought possible and you have never understood. Because you've never seen His leaven. It's only going to cost you the leaven that has messed you up to this point. Those doctrines of men that you hold to. The sin that you enjoy. The flesh that you indulge in. And the pain of the trauma that you can't seem to get rid of. He wants all that. Why? He's got something better. But you're going to have to lay down those things. You're going to have... You will not be able to taste the full freedom. You will not be able to understand what full freedom is. You're not going to be able to understand what the heart of the Lord is unless you get that leaven out of your life. And if that seems too hard, I guess legalism is for you. Then just get the leaven out. You know, the actual physical leaven? You know, like, thing like that? But now we're talking about the same thing we always talk about. It's like, well, okay, so what are we actually talking about here? Uh, oh, that's right. New covenant versus old covenant. People always say, oh, the new covenant is so much easier. It totally is, except it's way more not. Because you can actually do, I mean, you'll fail, but you can, you can have a measure of success with the Mosaic covenant doing it on your own but the new covenant there's no way in the world you're going to be able to new, do new covenant on your own and you cannot trust man and you cannot trust yourself but you can trust god proverbs 3 5 and 6 trust in the lord with all your heart lean not on your own understanding in all your ways Acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Proverbs 3, 5 and 6. Proverbs 3, 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord. Only. 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 Do not lean on your understanding. You cannot trust yourself. And when you try, you will be breaking God's commandment to trust in the Lord with all your heart. 
telling you what, boys and girls. That's what the Lord's calling this fellowship to. Proverbs 3, 5 and 6. That question is on the table today for you. And we're going to have to talk about that more later if you're interested. You want something with some power? Can you feel the gravity coming out? Okay. Proverbs 3, 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding in all your ways. Acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. We're coming up on the unleavened bread, folks. The Lord wants to bring something new to your life. And I ain't saying this like some sort of person for profit. I ain't saying this to try to get you to buy my book or subscribe to my channel. I'm telling you because this is what's coming down the pike for the Lord's people who are listening to the Lord. And I tell you what, the times are getting tighter where the Lord is going to give you less and less wiggle room. And it's up to you, boys and girls. It's up to you. There's going to be less and less wiggle room. That's why on the back of our sweatshirts we have a thing that goes like this. Because as time continues to go, you're going to have less and less wiggle room. It's unleavened bread, team. It's time to get that stuff out that's not right. It's time to get that stuff out of your life and out of your house that have been holding you back and disrupting everything and changing the way you look at things. Because the Lord is standing there and He's ready to pour into your life His leaven, His new leaven through His Holy Spirit to bring you into life and life more abundantly. But there can only be so much leaven. And you get to choose how much leaven of you you want in and how much leaven of Him you want in. I tell you, friend, beyond a shadow of doubt, I know what I would say. Let's get all my leaven out. Because it doesn't matter what it is. His is always going to be better. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much. Oh, Father God, we thank you so much for leading us into truth. We thank you so much for leading us into more and greater than. More maturity. More life. More life abundantly. Not fake life. Not rah-rah cheerleader stuff. But reality. Depth. Love. Your spirit lead, moving us and leading us into all things. Lord, help us to be a fellowship here in this coming time ahead. This Feast of Unleavened Bread is on its way. Help us, Lord, even right now to prepare well for the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Help us. Help us to be able to take out the, 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 the leaven in our personal life. Help us. I help us. And Lord, I ask that you just, just sweep your Holy Spirit through. Each and every one of us here in this fellowship, Lord, I ask that you sweep your Holy Spirit through to show us what that leaven is. Lord, because I know that so often we don't even know because it's been mixed so thoroughly with everything and it's created a huge problem. Lord, I ask that you show us the leaven in our lives. Show us the trauma that you want healed. Show us the sin that you want removed. Show us the, the incorrect theology and the teaching of the religious experts of the day that we have allowed in our lives to change our focus and to drop truth out of our life. Your truth, your real truth, your real Holy Spirit. Lord, I ask that you reveal to us what those things are so that we can get them out of our lives. Because, Lord, we want your truth and we want your life in our life. Exploding. Reaching into every fiber of our being so that your leaven goes into our life and leavens the entire life that we live and everything we do. Lord, I ask you, show us what that leaven is. And not just, Lord, we ask that you not just show us, show us how to get it out. 
because sometimes we can see it, but we don't know how to extract it. And Lord, we're going to need your Holy Spirit to do that. So Lord, I ask that you pour your Holy Spirit upon each and every one here to show them what it is that they need to pull out and how it is they need to pull it out. Who it is they need to talk to. Lord, I ask you to send a people to speak your word to. I ask that you help us to have hearts that are sensitive and open. That we would be able to hear. That we would be able to understand. That we would be able to get free. Lord, we know that that freedom comes through your son, Yeshua, who died for us on that cross so often, so long ago. Once and for all. Died for us. For freedom. For wholeness. To heal the broken heart to set free the captives that have been put in chains by the enemy. We thank you so much, Lord, for sending us your son. For setting us free from sin. And to bring us into a new covenant. And so, Lord, here today, we take this bread, we take this, we take this juice, it's like a small thing. As a physical reminder of the body and the blood that Yeshua gave for us. To bring us into not merely freedom, but new covenant. New covenant that leads to you. New covenant that's not limited merely to the temporal plane and existence that we live in. But a covenant that we can embrace and follow for all of eternity as we have a relationship with you. And Lord, as we take this juice and we take this bread, we're reminded of that new covenant and we're reminded of Yeshua and what he did for us and how integral, how critical he is in our lives. And Lord, we take that in ourselves here today. Remembering that he needs to be in us. He desires to operate in us and through us. Thank you, Father, for sending your Son to die for us on the cross. Help us to make, help us to step into that. We just ask that you just pour out your blessing, Father, upon each and every one here today. Blessings for wholeness. Blessings for healing. Lord, I know some of our family aren't here because they're not feeling well. And Lord, I ask that you just heal. That you bring full healing. Complete healing. 100%. And we ask that you provide. For those here today, Lord, who need provision. Lord, I ask that you bring provision. For those who need direction. I ask that you bring direction. I ask you speak. Speak. Lord, because we want to hear you. We want to listen. So, Lord, I ask that you help us. Help us to prepare well for the oh, Feast of Unleavened Bread that's coming. And help us to make full use of the blessing that you have for us. We ask this in your shoes. Amen. 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 Oh, Father God, thank you so much for all that you've done for us. Praise your Holy Praise your holy name. And so often as we're faced with the Feast of Unleavened Bread, Lord, sometimes sometimes there are things that we have in our lives that, that, that we don't even realize are a problem. Lord, we want them to be our own. So we ask that you take them out of our life so that we would be able to see you moving in us. And here today, Lord, we lift our voices together and we ask you. We ask you this. Please take from me my life when I don't have the strength to give it away to you. Please take from me my life when I don't have the strength to give it away to you, Jesus. times have I turned away the number is the 
May the Lord bless you, and may he keep you, and may his face shine upon you, and give you good success in all that you do. May the Lord richly pour out his leaven upon you, as you remove the leaven in your lives. Because when you do, he will. And his leaven is good leaven. May that leaven be poured out upon you, and upon your so that people will see the miracles that the Lord is doing in your life internally, externally, undeniably true. So that He would be glorified in all that you do and in all that you say and in all that you are. May the Lord bless you.